Hello, my name is Diane Lovell and I've been researching Brits at the Alamo. Today I want to tell you about some research I have found on one of the Scots named Richard Ballantyne. And I'd like to talk about finding his birthplace, him quite a bit about his family, and his trip to the United States. First of all, most Americans don't associate the Brits with the Alamo. When you think about the Brits with the Alamo, you think, what? This is a photo from 1975 with the Rolling Stones at the Alamo. And we also know that Phil Collins has been there and um, is obsessed with it and has given a lot of artifacts uh, that he collected over the years. But in recent years, in 2010, there was a good, big ceremony celebrating the four native Scots and many other defenders of Scots ancestry who gave their lives at the Alamo on March the 6th, 1836. The Minister of Tourism came and presented the Scottish flag and it was a huge deal, it's all over the news. And for instance, if you look at the Guardian newspaper from that day, it talks about how um, in 2010, there is a ceremony um, about the Alamo. If Scots or the Brits know anything about Texas, they often know about J.R. Ewing or the Alamo. Well, if you look through the newspaper articles, it talks about the four men that um, were uh, native to the Alamo. And one of those men is right here, Richard W. Ballantyne. And today I'm going to argue that Mm, that may not be true. Um, I have a feeling I've got pretty good proof that his birthplace is not in Scotland. Let's talk about that. Well, first, if you look at the many resources there are about the defenders of the Alamo and a, scar a sparse biographical material about each of them, um, they all conclude that Richard W. Ballantyne is born in Scotland in 1814 and that he died in uh, San Antonio at the Alamo in 1836. Well, the best piece of evidence to start with comes from the National Archives in Washington, D.C., the passenger list of vessels arriving in New York in 1820. Let's see if we can find his name. Indeed, we can. Uh, they come on a boat called the Criterion. And if you look right here, something I got off a of microfiche a uh, month or two ago, it says here, um, the Reverend William Ballantyne. He's 50 years old and he's a minister of the gospel and that's going to be pretty important. His wife is named Jane. He's got daughters, Margaret, Isabella. They're 18 and 17 and 1820. And next daughter is Miriam and uh, she's 15 years old. But they have a larger family. They have another daughter, Nancy, Catherine, Jean. Now a son finally, William, born. Um, in 1813. Then here's our Richard. Richard, born in 1814, another daughter, and then a son named John Ballantyne, who was one year and two months old. I think you should note that there is someone else who dies at the Alamo named John Ballantyne, and I think it is possible that they are related, uh, but that's for another day. Here is a typed up version of the manifest. And the key people here, the Reverend William Ballantyne, a minister of the gospel, is the most important clue. Ballantyne is not a real common name, and um, he's going to be much easier to find because he's a reverend and he's not in the established church. Uh, his wife is named Jane, and then, of course, he's got these sons, Richard, and then possibly of interest to us is John. What do we know about the manifest of this boat? Um, there's 49 passengers plus the crew, plus the cargo. I added up all their ages and divided in there. The average age is just a little bit over 21. There's seven families uh, aboard. There's a whole bunch of children. There's two classes of transportation for cabin and steerage. Most of the single people without a family are in steerage with one exception. Um, they are embarking from London and traveling across the Atlantic um, to New York, which I estimate takes about a month. They arrive the 27th of October, 1820. We also know from the manifest that no one died on this voyage. We know the captain's name. His last name is Avery. And um, if you look back at it, you'll see that right in between the first family listed on the manifest and the second, the Ballantines, is a name named James Dugan. He's 22 years old, and it just says he's a gentleman. 
Well, it's interesting. You can find out a little bit about him. He was um, a missionary, very much involved with the London Missionary Society. He had gone on a trip with three other missionaries to Sierra Leone. All of them fell desperately ill, and he's the only one to survive. And so in the Religious Intelligencer in May of 21, they uh, publish a letter of his and summarize it from August of 20, where they say Mr. Dugan's desire is to return as speedily as possible to the United States, as there are two ships to sail shortly to New York. One of them is the Criterion. And in fact, he does get on that boat. And it appears to me that he's very likely traveling with uh, the Ballantyne family. Why? Because they are both closely associated with the London Missionary Society, as we'll see in a little bit. What is known about this boat that our hero of the Alamo travels on as a young boy? Well, first, there is a painting of it, believe it or not. It was sold at auction a few years back, and of course it is in color. It's oil on canvas, and um, it's by a guy named Clement Drew. It also occasionally shows up as the ship that has brought packages from London for the Secretary of State for the United States. You could find this ship advertised in the London newspaper. The Morning Chronicle, here in 1820, says that it's a constant trader. It will sail in this advertisement on the 10th of April for New York. It is well known, fast sailing, an American ship criterion. It's coppered and copper fastened. Samuel Avery is the commander, 335 tons, lying in the London dock, has good accommodation for passengers both in her cabin and her steerage. But you can also send freight and you can take people. And these are the kind of advertisements that come frequently in the London papers about this and other ships. Now we could see in the 4th of August, 1820, um, at Graves End, the criterion with the Captain Avery has arrived from New York. Where is Graves End? This is the Thames Estuary. London is up here. And so it would have the ships come in to the estuary and at Graves End, um, they register that they're there. That's probably an insurance registration that they got across the Atlantic just fine. But we know that it's coming in August of 1820. We know that it's cleared to leave. It has a turnaround time probably of about a month before it leaves London port. And we know that it has been cleared to leave on the 25th of September, 1820. They, of course, get on that boat and they are on, this is the boat that they are on and they take a month and arrive 27 of October, 1820 in New York City. There's no steam aboard and steam um, is not quite on these ships and this is a sail across the Atlantic. Now, do we know for sure we've got the right Ballantine family? Well, let's look at the evidence. These are the British newspapers. The British Library has started to scan every printed newspaper in the country. Now, they don't have them all done, but they have millions of pages done, and the project's only been going on for about five years. And this one is very recently scanned, and I think it is the clue to why we haven't been able to find Ballantyne his origins. Notice the date. It's October of 1799 and it says on the 15th of the current month, so the 15th of October 1799, at Hamilton, which today is Hazeldean, Mr. William Ballantyne, a minister of the gospel, at Thurso, which is in Scotland, to Miss Jean White. And she is from Hazeldean or Hamilton. This is coming out of the Aberdeen Press. Well, that's very interesting. So this is probably the wedding. This is probably the wedding of his parents. Um, but very interestingly, this is the, at the 15th they got married. Let's look at a newspaper from the 15th um, of um, the same month, October 1799, where we're in court, the Circuit of the Judiciary at Inverness, 
William Ballantyne and a fella named John Cleghorn are brought to the bar charged with the offense of celebrating an irregular and clandestine marriages. They being members or missionaries of an association not known or recognized by law and styling itself the Society for Propagating the Gospel at Home. And this is against the law, both the common law and some acts passed by the Scottish Parliament um, in those years. And other things we know about them, about this court case, is that the indictment is read and the law of the country has wisely enjoyed certain solemnities as necessary to constitute a regular marriage. And these guys have solemnized their, have not done this in a, a due way. And they, there are a lot of complaints made from the county um, that their conduct of these missionaries could not, consistent with his duties, allow the public prosecutor to pass a notice, especially as their speeches and um, harangues have contributed to alienate the public from their established clergy. And it goes on to talk about how their language is, uh, is seditious to the government. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about their so Scotland. Goodness gracious, he is way high up in the Highlands. This is a very obscure place. It's about 690 miles to London. And if I were to go on a train in a modern world, it would take me at a minimum 13 hours. And sometimes it would take, uh, connections would take 22 hours. I could drive it from London theoretically in 12 hours, but it is a very obscure place. She was from the lowlands of Scotland. Here's Hazeldean. The dash here is the border between Scotland and England. And if I um, go zoom in here, just kind of show you where we are. Here's England and then Edinburgh and Glasgow and you're kind of in the Midlands here. And then by the time you get to Inverness, you're definitely in the Highlands. And then the populations get scarcer and scarcer and the daylight hours are shorter and it's colder and it's very close to the Orkney Islands. And the end of uh, Britain is John O'Groats, uh, the end of mainland Britain is. And people often, if they're going to walk the British Isles or high, uh, backpack, they'll go John O'Groats all the way down to Cornwall to Land's End. Now, it had an, a, a church, uh, established Church of Scotland that had been built in the 12th century. And this would have been what he would probably consider his enemy, the people he's trying to convert away from the established churches. And here's some of the ancient graves. It's a beautiful site if you take pictures in July, but there's not much... Um, uh, light in December, etc. I'm not sure I'd really want to live out there, but you can get a boat and you're really close to the Orkney Islands, but there'd be a lot more sheep out there than people. It can be picturesque, and um, but I think it would be cold and damp most of the year. They don't even get a railroad until 1874 in this far stretch of Scotland. You can see how picturesque it is. Well, did the Reverend William Ballantyne that we have documented here, did he, he's from Thurso, did he go to America? Well, strangely enough, he does. We know that he um, uh, moves to Pennsylvania in 1820 and starts a classical school. And so we have here from a site of the Churches of Christ, a historical biography. Um, it was published in 1904, but it's talking about a particular church that William Ballantyne, they call him an Englishman, but we'll have a lot of evidence that this is our guy that came, uh, he's born in Scotland, but he's going to have spent all these years right before he comes in England. And he kept a classical school here as early as 1820. Um, so he does come. And um, also, from the newspaper just recently scanned, it's from 1850, and it's a, celebrating uh, the 51st anniversary of a church in Thurso that Reverend Ballantyne founded. And it says, Mr. Ballantyne became a Baptist. He lived in London, many years a pastor of a small church there and a teacher. He afterwards went to America with his family and died there. And all of that is true of our guy. In 1829, we see him as teaching a Bible class, 
and Philadelphia. And we got lots, I got a lot more evidence than this, but this is enough to show you now. Um, he considers Philadelphia almost the native city of he and his colleagues. He's writing a letter to the son of uh, one of the other uh, preachers of the gospel uh, that was from England. His absence from us in this, his almost native city, I think uh, showing here that Ballantyne um, is getting very attached emotionally to Philadelphia. Now, what about, we know now that he um, was in Thoreau in 1799 or so, and then in 1820, we know he gets on a boat to come to America. What about the years in between? Well, strangely enough, the, most of the clues about what he does in his life come from the oddest source, a obituary of someone else, a Mr. Alexander Urquhart. And in this obituary, most of the words are about the man who brought him to Christ. And that is a Mr. Uh, William Ballantyne. Let's see here if I can get it to go back. There we go. Reverend Ballantyne, a talented and faithful minister of the gospel in Elgin, which is in Scotland, history somewhat singular and illustrates the origin and the rise of the congregational principles in, in Elgin. Ballantyne was a native of Edinburgh, raised by his uncle. And it says that he made a friend, Mr. Cleghorn, and that they seceded from another breakaway independent group. And they went down to an academy at Gosport under the care of a Dr. Boyd, who's very important. They returned to their native country, Scotland, burning with holy zeal to be messengers of the peace, those were living without God, and after some enthusiastic, laborious, and self-denying service as itinerants or home missionaries, Cleghorn becomes missionary at Wick, which is 20 miles from Thurseau, and Mr. Ballantyne at Thurseau. And then, after establishing a church at another location in Scotland, where Urquhart became a Christian, in 1807, Mr. Ballantyne left Elgin for London. He became a Baptist. He works with a really famous guy named William Jones, who publishes a lot. Afterwards, he removed to America and died an elder at the Baptist Church in Philadelphia in the same year that his son is killed at the Alamo in 1836. Okay, so we're learning a lot about him. Now, one thing that is noted there, that he went to the Gosport Academy for two years, and that's actually before um, 1799. The Gosport Academy was heavy in their curriculum on languages, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and, uh, and French, and so classical languages. And they're very much associated with the London Missionary Society. They send people all over uh, the globe, but even to North America. In 1808, we know Ballantyne's in London. He is teaching in London, and look, he's closely associated with the Scots and with William Jones in London in 1808. So in 1807, we have a site that says he goes to London in 1808. We know he's teaching in London, and we know that he is not in any newspaper, because I can do a search, um, and there's nothing mentioned of him running a school or an academy uh, before 1810. But in 1810, it appears that he is running a classical school in London. Notice he does that when he gets to um, Philadelphia in 1820, and it's a classical school. And this looks like how he's making his living. He's at South 10 South Crescent Street in Bedford Square, London. And then in 1811, he continues to run his classical school at the same location. And he's advertising for students in 1812. He's advertising for students again in the London newspapers. And his name is here, the Academy. It's on 10 South Crescent Street. And he's teaching Latin and Greek and Hebrew, which he's been trained in. But this is the most important to me at all. In 1814, the year that Richard Ballantyne is born, the man who dies at the Alamo, his father lives at number 10 South Crescent in London. This comes from a report on the state of the Northern Dispensary. Um, it documents that in 1813 and 1814, he lived there because he is listed as one of the governors. These uh, give This institution raises funds for the needy for medicine and surgery and midwifery. And 
that's where he lives. And so this is where, um, if his wife is with him, this is where Richard a Ballantine is born, not in Scotland, but down here. This is in London, very close to the British Museum, which was not standing at the time. But um, if you've been to the British Museum or you go, these are the big uh, columns there. And um, uh, this, just a few blocks away, and this is Bedford Square right here, is where he was born. Now, in 1816, the family is still at South Crescent, and he has published a book, the father has published a book on Latin, and he's still called uh, the master of this particular school. But in 1817, he probably moves schools or starts a new one. Um, and it is at Squire Mount, Hampstead Heath, London. And this turns out to not be very successful as we find out, but this is 1817. In 1817, he's selling his Latin reader still. In 1818, he's advertising for students. And he, he needs, uh, he has accommodation for a few more pupils in 1818, in January of 1818. Again, advertising for students, and he usually doesn't advertise, but just once a year. Every accommodation for a few more students, even though school has already resumed, he's advertising. In 1818, again, before the term ends, it's the 14th of December. And he says pupils have finished their studies and desirous of filling their places with others. He's advertising for students. And then right before the term starts on the last day of the year, he's got a spots. In 1819, advertises just before Christmas. Not much said there in 1819. We have some um, images actually of Squires Mount in 1826. Um, you can see that um, it's a little bit after they leave this place, but it's really rural, even though it's the heart of London today. Squires Mount, a view in 1826. Believe it or not, Constable, John Constable, paints a painting uh, from Hampstead Heath looking down towards Harrow. And that's probably Ballantyne right there as a young boy, Richard Ballantyne. I bet that's him. But I couldn't believe there's a Constable painting, uh, several actually, done there by Constable. In 1820, our Ballantines sell everything. We know that they're about to head to America. It's the 19th of June, 1820, and we know they get on a boat in September. Squires Mount, Hampstead Heath, they are the lease for an unexpired term of 18 years on Squires Mount Academy and the houses adjoining and all the household furnitures, the carpets, the dining room table, the Bibles, the books, uh, things that they can't afford to take across the Atlantic. And so I've concluded that Richard Ballantyne is probably not born in Scotland, although his parents are Scottish. Um, I also think there is, uh, I have a much weaker argument, but I do think there's a chance that the John Ballantyne who is a uh, noted as being born in Pennsylvania is probably, uh, or not probably, is possibly um, his brother or a relation to him. There is good evidence that John Ballantyne um, is not his brother, but there's some evidence that I don't have time for here that should be considered. Um, I appreciate the time today. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you. Here is my email address. Feel free to uh, ask me any questions or comments because I really would like some input. Thank you so much.